In this week's episode of the LA Business Podcast, our guest is Ron Rudzin, CEO and founder of Sattva. You may have heard their ads on NPR. They're a big performance marketer. And Sattva is a premium luxury mattress brand. They do $400 million in sales in 2021. And in this show, we talk about his thesis on the retail, the great retail transformation. We talk, talk about his uh, f- the founding of his company and how he bootstrapped it to go a little bit slower and to build muscle in different parts of his business. And we talk about his pivots during COVID. Let's jump right into this week's episode of the LA Business Podcast. Welcome to the LA Business Podcast, your destination to hear stories of how businesses grow and scale. I'm Robert Brill, CEO of Brill Media and the host of this podcast. Now, let's jump right into this week's interview. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the LA Business Podcast. Today, our guest is Ron Rudzin, founder and CEO of Sattva. Sattva has been the fastest growing online brand in the bedroom category over the pandemic, growing to over $420 million in revenue in 2021. Uh, Ron, you bootstrapped the company. We're really interested uh, to hear about your founder's journey. Um, I've certainly heard your heard your ads. I feel like I've heard them on NPR um, so very, this is very exciting for me. Thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Looking um, forward to chatting with you. Yeah. So, so Ron, tell us about, tell us about why you started Sattva. Tell us about the circumstances there. Sure. So, um, you know, in the early two thousands as the internet was starting to, uh, become, uh, so prevalent in our lives and e-commerce, um, I, my, my past life, I was at home furnishings, investing and managing furniture uh, companies. So um, in, in, in about 2008, um, I realized that I wanted to really attack e-commerce. And I recognized that the highest margin item in the home furnishing space was the luxury mattress. Uh, so I went and I attacked that. I went and I did a raw materials analysis of the best selling uh, luxury mattresses in the country that people would see at brick and mortar, such as, you know, Stearns and Foster Euro pillow tops and Simmons Beater S Black, which are fantastic beds, but they would sell for approximately $2,500. And once I did the raw materials analysis, um, you know, cost of, of springs, foam, uh, you know, the cover that I wanted to use, I realized that I could sell the same quality bed, level quality uh, for about $1,000 less online with a home trial. So we were really the first ones at scale to sell mattresses online. Um, and uh, that's how that was kind of like the idea is how we got that's how we got started. And uh, from from the consumer perspective, what should we be looking out for for a luxury mattress? Because my mattress, I don't know what it is. I buy it at some store and I I, I, I swear to you. Two to three nights a week, we lay in the bed and we're like, oh, this mattress. So what's a good mattress? What should sure. we be looking out for? Sure. Well, one thing, anytime people today mention mattress and online, they think it's a bed in a box. We're not a bed in a box. We sell luxury mattresses just like you see in stores all over the country. Uh, so like our classic inner spring is built with two coil units. It's a do coil unit, which is the best design to prevent sagging. We use high grade foams. Uh, Our fabrics that we cover our beds in are all uh, made with antimicrobial uh, organic cotton. We use a natural fizzle for our flame retardant, so there's no harmful sprays or or, or chemicals. Um, Our beds beds cannot be compressed. Our industry cannot be compressed into a small box. It would actually break a compression machine. Uh, So we've we've been very fortunate to, uh, you know, build out a network that allowed me to deliver these luxury products all over the country right now. We have 19 factories that build for us. Uh, we have a, we're partners with 150 in-home white glove delivery installation companies. We also not only just bring in and give you a luxury product, but we also give you a luxury experience where we take out all the debris. We take out your old bed and obviously set up the new one. Amazing. Uh, and, and I imagine when you lay on it, it just feels fan, fantastic, right? Well, you know, obviously when you use quality materials, yeah. luxury materials, high quality foams, high quality fabrics, um, high quality springs, um, you know, you're going to get a, a luxury feel and also you're going to get a bed that lasts 10 years plus. Um, so we're very proud of uh, the products that we've built. Now we are in seven categories because we've built this you know, huge network of manufacturing and in-home white glove delivery companies. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
um, we're able to be in multiple categories. So we are in the luxury Innispring category. We do ultra premium memory foam. Mm -hmm. We do um, latex, a, a pure natural latex, the most natural bed you'll find on the market today. We also do a latex hybrid where we put a little Innispring in it, uh, make it a little more cost efficient if you want something all natural. Uh, we also do a, a heavy duty for folks that are 300 to 500 pounds of true luxury matches for them, not just a board. We do a luxury youth bed um, as well, uh, which is for it flips from age three to seven from and then mm. to eight to 12. It flips. So it's beautiful. And we also do a, a customizable air, uh, which is 50 settings as well. So uh, we just have a beautiful array of, uh, of mattresses and we've curated what we believe to be the best mattress in each category. We don't make the customer think too much. You tell us what category you want to be in, come mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll, we'll explain to you why we've curated the best bed at the most efficient price in the country. Hmm. So, so you're quoting the New York Times, um, people who raise money rather than be self-funded tend to spend wildly because it's other people's money and they throw a bunch of stuff on the wall to see what sticks. I don't do it that way. I'm much more meticulous and efficient. I might go a little slower, but in the end, I believe I win. Tell us a little bit more about that. That's sure. fascinating. Well, you know, anytime I speak to any anybody who's looking to be an entrepreneur, uh, you know, uh, it's 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 very enticing to take some pressure off and if you can raise money. But if you truly believe in what you're doing and you truly believe that you have um, a business that that just needs time and will be successful, if you take money from from investors early, you're giving up equity. I never wanted to do that. I have uh, great partners. And we all agreed that we would we would take it slowly. Uh, we were always very efficient. We were always ROI focused. Mm -hmm. um, so it taught us to be so um, deliberate in what we do and disciplined in what we do from from the from the day I started the business. So we've been profitable since the first year we launched. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe you can have profitable growth. There are other companies in our space particularly a lot of the uh, younger bed in the box companies that went out and spent money wildly, lost tremendous amounts of money. Mm -hmm. um, and I just never, I, ne I never got baited into that. We just always believed that there was a way to do profitable growth um, be by behaving well as a brand, um, making sure that you uh, have great customer service. Um, I, I like to control every touch point. I've decided not to sell on Amazon. Um, I built my own distribution. I wanted to control every touch point and uh, we did all the hard work. We set up, uh, you know, building our manufacturing and, and distribution base was uh, extremely, extremely hard. Uh, not many folks can do it. Um, we, you know, our, our, our network is probably only second to mattress firm and they have 2,600, you know, stores. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we, we just felt like bootstrapping was, was a smart way to go in 2018. We built the business up to a level uh, that we felt um, it was time that we sold 30% of the company. So we have a private equity partner. Uh, it was all a liquidity event. Uh, we never needed business. We never needed to raise money to um, uh, to move the business forward um, or to, um, you know, help it. It was, we, we, it's always been self-funded. So I'm very proud of that today. Can you tell us about some of the learnings or experiences you've had along the way that may have surprised you as you're building this business, as it's a bootstrap business. Tell us about like something that might be like, wow, I didn't think this would be a thing that is relevant to me. Absolutely. Uh, I, I always go to the, you know, I, I talk about this often. Uh, I speak about it often with my team as well. Um, so, you know, when you think about, you know, being in business for 10 years and, and you know, my first career, I was in brick and mortar and, and that lasted a long time. We had a very successful, you know, uh, company, 200 stores. So I did brick and mortar and then I did digital. Um, so just, a, you know, odd to have, have both of those things. But what I learned in this business, um, if I had one thing to do different, because everything kind of really worked out well for us and we're in a great position where we're probably going to take the company public this year. Mm -hmm. We're very excited about it. We're excited to be in a position to do that. You know, not only do we do a lot of revenue, but we also have double digit EBITDA, mm -hmm. which is highly unusual for a growth business like ours. But if I had to do one thing different is I just wish I had built my data team earlier today. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how younger, smaller companies do it. Unless you can afford a big data team, I, you, you're going to get eaten up. So if I like, you know, we're doing, we'll do, we, we just came off a year. We did four, 420 million. We'll probably be up around 500 million this year. 
Uh, we'd probably be 100, 150 million ahead if I had invested in my data team earlier. We, we, I started building it out about three, three and a half years ago mm -hmm. uh, to really, a, a, you know, a powerful level. Uh, I should have done that seven years ago. I should have taken more money and just pumped it into data because today, the beauty of business today is that, you know, especially e-commerce, there's so much data available to you. And if you're willing to put the time in, spend the money on, on, on really, uh, you know, incredible folks that, that live data, um, they feed your, um, they feed your operations. They feed, they feed your marketing team. They feel they feed your digital product team. Um, and I just wish that I had, uh, invested in that earlier. Uh, I started, like I said, about three and a half, four years ago, but I, I should have done it about six or seven years ago. So when you say, uh, your data team invests in operations, marketing, and digital product, like, can you tell us about, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm interested really in the, in the marketing side, but also operations. Like, you know, we're a media buying and advertising firm and certainly data is at the core of what we do and in, in, in our business does. Um, but tell us about how data can be used and how the advantages you have for building a data team. And, and when you say building a data team, what does that actually mean? What type, what types of roles do you have in your data team? Yeah, well, we have, we, the way I decided to design it, uh, this was a decision that we made, uh, you know, like I said, three and a half, four years ago. Um, I wanted to, instead of, um, you know, putting it in silos, just like marketing, having its own data team um, and, you know, operations having its own data team. I decided to just have one data team uh, with a lead um, and then it's broken off into divisions and it serves the company. So the folks that go out and do, you know, manufacturing and delivery and, and deal with our customer service teams, uh, you know, we use data measurement for, you know, monitoring our factories and our uh, delivery partners, as well as our customer service representatives. Um, you know, all of my leaders now can go and, uh, you know, at the touch of a button, get all the information that they need to make smart decisions fast. Um, Marketing, I don't have to explain to you because you said you're in the my marketing business, so you know uh, that's the most important role that data plays. Yeah. Obviously, today with uh, e-commerce, you know, uh, obviously, tr you know, tracking a customer where we got them, whether we whether we're doing performance marketing, whether we're doing something in social, or whether we're going out of market, you know, you need to have a strong data team so you know where you're spending the money. That's obvious. And then digital product people, you know, our data team working with our website, you know, we're, we're doing today. Uh, you know, our team, we have about 90 folks between engineering and digital product um, working daily. And the way that works is, you know, I can have a team of 60. I can have a team of 120. How fast do I want to move mm -hmm. as, 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 as a company? Uh, so, you know, and you toggle that as a CEO, right? I, I look at the world and I say, well, I see real opportunity this year. Maybe I'll step on the gas and I'll make that team a little larger. Or if I feel some headwinds coming, I might make it a little smaller. But generally speaking, you know, I like where we're at. I, I always, um, you know, we're doing multiple, multiple tests uh, every day uh, from, you know, the easy stuff from colors to font sizes to call to action buttons to different photography, uh, different experiences. Um, so this is all all data driven. So, um, you know, we can go in and do certain things. And, and, and it's great when when you can sit today as i compare it to 30 years ago or 25 years ago where everything was so intuitive back then right today you can almost make decisions with mathematical certainty i love it how do you how do you look at the upper funnel versus the lower funnel for your business right like this is always the um there's almost like a point of friction with advertisers like i need to fill i need to fill the top of the funnel so that i have someone who's primed and ready to buy but I also need my media to perform immediately with very limited uh, increase in cost per acquisition or a decrease in ROAS, right? So there's this friction. I need upper funnel and I need lower funnel. How do you look at that and, and how does your team make good on both if they do? Sure. It's a great question. So we have been a performance marketing company where we are, you know, we feel we are we're the best in our space at performance marketing. Um, and that's in market lower funnel. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's what we focus on. We now, uh, my, my focus, you know, as you started to ask before, you know, uh, we, as we're bootstrapping, we wanted to become, um, you know, experts at performance marketing, low funnel, 
when the customer came in market, we felt we knew how to capture them for the premium mattress. Those are the customers that are spending a thousand dollars more. We knew where to get them. We knew where to find them and we knew how to sell them. Uh, and we, 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 that's why, uh, we've been ROI focused and performance marketing was our best bang for the buck. Uh, now that we're at the level where we've built out this enormous infrastructure, uh, as I said, them our, our manufacturing and delivery network, um, our products are all set, you know, we're in seven categories, our top of bed marketplace, you know, for pillows, organic sheets and things of that nature is all built out. We just keep adding to those products. But now we feel that we're in a position that you can go out and do out of market advertising top funnel. Hmm. Um, if you're not built well um, to capture the consumer as they get closer to buying in the lower funnel, you know, you waste, you might waste a lot of money at the top funnel. So uh, as you know, by reading about us, you know, we're a very patient, deliberate organization. Mm -hmm. And I was very patient. I was very happy with our growth rate, doing performance marketing, getting the customer when they're in market at the low funnel. Mm -hmm. I am now uh, in 2022 prepared to really step on the gas and start spending money in the top funnel mm -hmm. uh, because I feel that we're so prepared uh, for that consumer. And mm -hmm. uh, so uh, over time, uh, you know, right now we're at about, you know, uh, probably a little over 90% performance mm -hmm. and we're spending, you know, uh, seven, eight, nine percent on top funnel, and uh, we will start to change that ratio. I could see us uh, in the next three years, um, you know, at, at 60 percent performance and 40 percent top funnel. So, and then that top funnel, as you said, will start to um, help accelerate our performance business. So, it's, it, I, I like our plan. I like the, I, I like that we've been patient with it. A lot of companies come out and they just attack, you know, the top funnel. And they're not prepared for, you know, they don't have a business yet. Uh, I was more into building the business first, patiently taking my money from the, you know, the, the in market customer and, and, and catering to them that work well for us. And now we can go have some fun and be creative and, and start uh, uh, getting people more aware of our brand. So as you look at 2022, um, you've taken, uh, you work with a private equity firm or you're, you're, you've, an invest, I don't know, you, might, you have a partner, a 30% 30, 30 partner. You're thinking about going public. What are the, what is the trigger for when a company should be thinking about going public? Um, well, I, I, I think every, every, every organization has their, their reasons. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are a lot of young startup companies that are losing money and it's like the option to go public and do that. We're not in mm -hmm. that position. Yeah. Uh, we, for us, um, my decision this year was, was based on, um, a theory I have, um, which, which I call the retail transformation and that's happening and I wanted to be part of it. And I felt that, uh, we were now, um, we were just, it, we were just prepared to be a public company. Now, mm -hmm. uh, we're highly profitable, double digit EBITDA mm -hmm. on, uh, a, a certain level of business, which I think, you know, will be a great public company. Mm -hmm. uh, but the retail transformation, just to jump forward, is mm -hmm. we've been an e-commerce only company, right? Pure DTC, pure direct to consumer. I decided clearly that I did not want to go wholesale. A mm -hmm. lot of people in the on the on the online side uh, went wholesale. I would never do that. Um, I feel like putting our product on you know, 2000 floors, I could do that tomorrow. Retailers like having the online companies come into their stores. Um, I didn't want to do that. I want to control every touch point. So I felt like the brand is like primed and ready for growth. So I decided to open up um, what I call viewing rooms and do it differently than regular retail. You know, uh, years ago, uh, when you were doing specialty retailing, everyone thought that you had to have like a store in every corner and every town. But today, when you're an e-commerce first company, you can now um, have just one store, what I call a viewing room, right. on the best street in the best town where we convert best, where my data tells me to go. So we'll be on you know, Melrose uh, and San Vicente and right on the corner in Los Angeles. We're on Post Street in San Francisco, Newberry Street in Boston, Lincoln Park in Chicago, right. or 57th Street in Manhattan. Um, uh, and we're on 14th Street in D.C. 
and I open up these viewing rooms that now really allow me to build the brand because mm-hmm. when I started the business, 0% of people were buying mattresses online. Now it's about 21%. Mm-hmm. In three years, it might be 26%. In, four, in, in five years, it might be 31%. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to enjoy that. But as I enjoy that, I wanted to also capture the other you know, 75% of people that need to still touch and feel. Right. right. So there's an e-commerce com- cu- customer and there's a, still a customer that needs to go touch and feel. So um, we'll always keep our retail footprint small um, and we are always be an e-commerce company first. In fact, we call the marquee on the marquee. It's called Safa.com. Mm-hmm. So when you walk into the viewing room, it actually says Safa.com. We want everyone to understand there's an efficiency to our business. Mm-hmm. And walk by a drive by and you see a sign that says Safa.com, you'll Google it. Once you Google it, going back to my other point, we're great at capturing the customer once they come online. So with all of these things that were happening this year, I felt this was the time that we're going to go out and let's become a public company. Uh, let's tell our story to the world, to the business world. Let's get, um, let's put ourselves in a position to, 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 to become a billion dollar company. And we believe we have a very, very strong plan to do a billion dollars in revenue over the next five years. And you're reinforcing, uh, you know, so- someone, someone who I, one of my mentors was, you know, told me like the you're, the medium is the message, right? So going to these premium environments reinforces definitely the premium nature of your of your business and your brand. Yeah, well, you know, look, if you go to the today, I think retail has changed, right? Mm-hmm. I think you know, if you're just a retailer that's waiting for you know a customer to walk in, you know, okay, I'm sure there's a business that can survive that, but most won't. You know, even if you take companies like, uh, and I'm not speaking like I have a knowledge of this, but I'm just using like a name, like a J Crew, where you just know mm-hmm. they're everywhere. Maybe they don't need to have if they if they strengthen their e-commerce business, right? Maybe they don't need to be on every exit down the turnpike. Maybe mm-hmm. they can be on every eight exits down the turnpike. Right. So today, I just wanted to make sure that we were putting the brand, our viewing room, in areas that you know, um, uh, you know, a couple. Uh, they can meet each other for dinner, but they want to go and see, you know, see friends, have drinks, go to a restaurant. And we want to be in that area. I think retail will be very strong in those areas. B and C retail will will struggle for years after, you know, COVID. But I think the the grade A locations where there are things to do, great experiences, uh, we want to do that. In our viewing rooms, we really set them up to capture kind of that that feel today. We wanted people to have a great experience. If they're going out, they're gonna have a great dinner, meet friends, go for drinks, do some shopping, and we're, we'll be on that list. And then when they come into us, we wanted to create these incredibly warm settings. Uh, there's an iPad next to every product that we sell. You don't really need a salesperson when you come in. Um, we have workstations for you to, uh, you know, obviously order online there, or you can just do more research while you're sitting in our viewing room. We do have obviously people there to, to cater to you, but it's like a no pressure environment beautifully warm, you know, very much like a restoration hardware type feel. Uh, but with technology, we partnered with Samsung. So we, we give the consumer a great experience. And I love being part of that. So it's, uh, I believe you're, you're calling that beducation. <laughs> that's, uh, I'm going to start using that one right now. <laughs> Someone I'm was stealing, telling. I'm stealing, I'm stealing that one from you. No, no, like, no, that's not me. You guys, this yeah, is I don't think I've ever said be- be- education, but I really do like that. Maybe my team has. But, I think your team I has. Like I think your team has. Um, okay. Do you, I mean, have you seen, you know, 2020, 2021 were really tough years all around. Um, what are some of the, how did that affect your business? What, how, I mean, it sounds like your business is growing exponentially here, right? So um, over the course of eight, five, eight years, what do you, what has your experience been over the last two years and in terms of sales and any sort of trends, what does it look like moving forward? Yeah. Well, we had, you know, obviously when, uh, when uh, COVID hit scary for everyone, of course, uh, we were fortunate enough to keep our business going and thriving. Uh, we, you know, you know, originally we were, we were, we were building 75 in my network. We were building 75,000 masks a week to donate to hospitals and police departments and fire departments all over the country. So I felt great about that. Uh, but home furnishings became, you know, and and e-commerce and home furnishings was, was just a great combination for the business. Um, we have seen over the last two years, there has been an acceleration. What's happening now, the amount of e-commerce that you see happening now, we always knew would happen. Uh, but we think it got accelerated about a year, year and a half. Uh, so obviously we enjoyed that. Uh, the issue for me uh, was I always prided myself on giving the absolute best customer service. 
even earlier in the earlier days of Sattva, when it was a smaller uh, organization, I had 24 seven customer service. So if somebody had a problem or a question three o'clock in the morning, they can call and a nice kid would answer the phone and answer their questions. Amazing. Yeah, no, it was, it was great. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I just think that, uh, you know, our, our issues became supply chain, just like everyone else. We were able to do a lot of business, but you know, we had, um, you know, our steel was put on allocation, you know, even though we we're a big client of, you know, our major supplier, Leggett and Platt in the middle of the country, um, you know, so we had delays for the first time. Uh, I think in September 2020 was the first time, you know, we went off of having like the most pristine reputation because we wound up being a little late on items. We're now at the tail, tail end, I think 30, we're about 30 days away from being completely normalized. Uh, in every pocket of the country for how long it takes to get you your bed. And remember, we're not a we're not a company that that you know holds inventory in basements or in warehouses. You order a mattress from Sattva, we get you our eco luxury mattress made fresh for you. You mm -hmm. order it, it has a birth date after the date you ordered it mm -hmm. when it comes to you. And people love that about us. But they didn't love when we were obviously late during during COVID and we dealt with a lot of that. And you know, it was sad to, you know, see some cancellations come in after a while and then they go buy a bed that they weren't as into uh, from some company. But, uh, you know, we, we dealt with it. We dealt with the stresses of it. My, my team was stressed from it, uh, but uh, we're past it now. And I, it's not like we were any different than any other mattress company. Everybody, right. everybody in the home furnishings, I shouldn't say mattress, but any furniture company that you've spoken to, I'm sure will tell you the same exact thing. Furniture is actually dealing with it even more than we are right now. You know, me, I was able to, um, you know, work, by the way, for our foam suppliers, we also had issues with storms down south, uh, which caused problems with chemicals. And that obviously impacts the the foam business in the country. Uh, so we, we, we were able to pretty maneuver pretty quickly. I think we worked on pace, you know, like great companies that are out there, like Temper Sealy and Simmons, sort of the big ones. They have manufacturing all over just like we do. I think we, we kept on pace with them. Is, is your goal... Is your goal for Sattva to be a, a household a household name? My my goal for Sattva is to be the next generation S brand. S brand. Well, you know they always say the big S brands. You know, CLE, Certus, Simmons. Oh, Sturt, got and it. Also. And uh, when I named the company, um, I actually named it with that in mind. I wanted to. There was a few things I wanted to start with an S. I wanted it to be five or six letters. I wanted it to be two syllables. I wanted it to be cool looking as a as a as a logo. Um, and then I also wanted to have some some level of um, uh, you know international appeal. Totally, uh, and it's and, a unique name. Holy cow! It is quite a unique yeah. name. I get I get a lot of ripping for it. You know, like people like because it's hard to pronounce and everything. But I'm I'm kind of proud of it. Our our, our designer at the time, our creative director at the time, um, you know, I told her you know what I was looking for. I wanted to bring truth and purity basically to the mattress industry. Um, you know, back then in 2008, 2009, right before I was launching, I, I was seeing that people could not, you know, um, they would get stuck between the brand and the retailer. If they had a, if they had a problem with a warranty, the brand would blame the retail, the retail would blame the brand. You couldn't comparison shop. So I wanted to bring this, you know, all to, to light. And, um, uh, Sattva is Sanskrit for truth and purity. So, mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of how we came to the name. And I love that it's international. You know, when you think we're, we're a premium customer, I mean, I'm sorry, premium, uh, you know, uh, product. And uh, you think about, you know, uh, folks of uh, Asian Indian descent and uh, there's, you know, it's American enough. We're an American made company. All of our products are made in America. But I wanted to just appeal to everyone. And I just wanted to have this international feel. And I felt that it hit all those marks, even though some people will still say, I can't remember the whole the name of that company is. You, know, so. you can't remember it. That it, I, I think the uniqueness of the name makes it actually so much more appealing. But so. uh, yeah, one, one, once we become a household name, which we will be, by the way, in about two or three years, um, yeah, mm -hmm. that will happen. First of all, first of all, we'll take over the major cities. The first, in the first, in the fifteen major cities where we're opening our viewing rooms first, we'll have those open by. We ha we'll have the the first six, as I mentioned, they'll be open by uh, the end of the first quarter. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, well, we have another, uh, six or seven opening up this year. And then the following year, we're opening up another 15. Hmm. So Ron, uh, as we wrap up here, tell us where people can find Sattva just, just as a recap. Yeah. The best thing to do is just go to Sattva.com, start your journey there. 
uh, buying a mattress is a, um, a tough thing. But one thing great about the space today, and this is not a compliment to SOT for itself, I do give a lot of other players out there credit because what's happened, if you look back 12 years ago, you couldn't get any information on mattresses. Today, you know, a quality sleep is really tied to health and wellness. Mm -hmm. I tell everyone that you have to treat sleep like an activity. If you're mm -hmm. going to go play tennis, if you're going to go for a run, if you're going to play field hockey, you're going to um, you prepare for it. Mm -hmm. Same thing with sleep. You have to make sure the room has the right temperature. You got to be wearing the right clothes. You have to have the right sheets. Get make sure you're, you're you know if you like to take a warm shower. Whatever you need to do, you have to have you be prepared for it. I mean, every, everyone's going to conk out on a fun night with friends after a couple of cocktails, maybe, and you fall asleep on a couch. That's never good for you. No. You always feel best when you have a high quality sleep. And you want to make sure um, uh, that, that, that you're doing that. Also, today, there's so much content. Sattva, I've spent, you know, seven digits writing content. We have over 600 articles on how sleep is tied to health and wellness and every other question you can have about sleep um, in the Sattva blog. Mm -hmm. uh, but not just us. Uh, so many other companies have done great work. So you, anything that you need to find out, uh, mm -hmm. anybody who has, where you have a sensitivity to a specific brand, go find it. Hopefully it's us. But if not, you'll find someone out there where there's just great information about sleep, health, wellness, um, and all those things. That's one thing that I think the, the, the entire space has done a good job in the last, I'm going to say, five or six years. Awesome. Yeah. Ron Rudzin, founder and CEO of Sattva. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it and take great care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the LA Business Podcast. If you like what we're doing on this podcast, please consider subscribing on Apple or Google Play, leaving a five-star review, and sharing with your friends. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for a guest you'd like to hear on this podcast, please email me, robert at brillmedia.co. Thank you. Have a fantastic day.